wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the non-economic objectives concern, since this is what a lot of people think about when they think about worries with sovereign wealth friends. I mean, how do you assess political objectives when you're trying to use a calculus like this? Which countries do you find the most concern about? And I don't see Russia mentioned here. Uh, is Russia a concern when it comes to sovereign wealth funds? Well, I think this is a, uh, a difficult area, quite frankly, um, because economic objectives and non-economic objectives are not particularly well-defined terms. Uh, and uh, uh, one could say, if I wanted to be provocative, and those people who know me know I never want to be provocative, uh, uh, Abu Dhabi's investment in Citigroup was a uh, politically motivated investment. Uh, had no economic content to it. Uh, now, I think that's probably not right, <laughs> uh, but I'm sure that if you asked uh, 100 people on the street, you probably would get at least a third of them saying that. Uh, uh, so it is, you know, you 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 would like to have, and I think the best thing you can have, uh, uh, other than just having them say we don't invest for uh, for non-economic obje political objectives. Uh, the best way you can do that is to have them have a formal structure, uh, so that the uh, the political process of uh, which is responsible ultimately for the management of the funds is separated from the in actual investment decisions, uh, and uh, and that there not be on the other hand that there ought not be retribution uh, in connection with the, those decisions when they go wrong as long as they comply broadly with the framework that's been laid out by the by the uh, political uh, political process. Russia is a uh, good case. Uh, it is on the scoreboard. Uh, it now has two funds. Uh, it used to have one, and we just, just and we actually scored it as if it had one because until a few months ago it had only one, and it's been split into two pieces. Its uh, sovereign wealth fund is among the more, uh, as you'll see, is among the more um, uh, transparent and accountable, and the structure is very well known. The issues with respect to Russia are not about. The sovereign wealth fund investments, they are they're about government-owned or government-controlled entities outside of the sovereign wealth fund, sovereign wealth fund area. And one of the problems in all of this, in my view, is that people tend to lump together investments by government-owned entities, right, with uh, uh, sovereign wealth fund investments, uh, which tend to be, not always, but tend to be more of a portfolio uh, type. Ted, I know that you, you couldn't get information on returns from over half of the non-pension funds, but with respect to the 44% of the non-pension funds and all the pension funds, did you do any? Did you make any effort to correlate returns with your criteria for good practices? Not yet. Is the answer? We were just recording whether they. We were just recording uh, whether they actually announced their announced their returns uh, or published their returns. But that's the next uh, another step. Sensible, sensible question. Okay, who's next? Yeah, in the back. Have you given any thought to the... Could you identify, please? Oh, my name is Chris Stone. I work for Senator uh, Bingaman from New Mexico. Uh, have you given any thought to the... WTO compliance with some of, of some of these recommendations, and and what I have in mind is uh, one of the principles of the WTO is that you can't discriminate between is national treatment. You can't discriminate between goods of, from one country vis-a-vis -vis another, uh, and yet some of these recommendations seem to me to be. Applied uh, based on national <coughs> origin. And curious whether any thoughts been given to how that works. Or well, as you know, um, uh, the WTO has a investment component. Uh, uh, it is fair to say that 
improving that component was taken off the agenda in the Doha round. Uh, my colleague uh, Arvind Subramanian thinks that, um, who's back there somewhere, I was earlier, thinks that actually this whole thing should be turned over to the WTO and negotiated a compact uh, both, uh, both on inward and outward, uh, both for the, on both sides, the, both in and out sides uh, in, that, in that context. Uh, uh, I suppose one might get there, but uh, I wouldn't hold my breath of it of its producing any uh, really concrete results in the in my I was going to say my lifetime. That's probably an exaggeration. But in the next ten years, so uh, given the heat that you have um, uh, on this issue in our country, and and the reluctance in some of the sovereign wealth fund countries to uh, to even sign up to something voluntary, uh, I think uh, we're better off going the voluntary uh, uh, name and shame route uh, uh, and getting there a little faster uh, before we try to toss this into a to a concentrate uh, into a uh, a protracted negotiation, which you know many people don't want to negotiate. I mean, having a having a a big investment treaty, uh, which while some of us uh, good government types might think it was a good idea. Uh, I think it's uh, not likely to come around very quickly, and, uh, and meanwhile we have to deal with what we have. Uh, so in principle you could do that. Uh, but I think in some sense the fund and the International Monetary Fund and the bank and the W2O are the three pillars or three major pillars of international economic governance, and uh, it doesn't really matter which pillar you emphasize in, in particular in terms of trying to address what is a common issue. Ted, since I did make an egregious omission in my introduction, <laughs> as you noted, in failing to uh, uh, reference your work on IMF reform, uh, how about linking the two? Uh, you focused on an IMF set of guidelines and such. Um, suppose that were to proceed as you propose, uh, would this be a new lease on life for the IMF? Would it be that big for them? Uh, would it be an important <coughs> element as the IMF now tries to find its way as to what is its role going forward. And then flip around to the other side. You mentioned in passing that there is a parallel effort to devise some rules of the road for host countries to sovereign wealth fund investment. Uh, that is going on in the OECD. What do you see on that front, and how do you relate the two? Well, on the fund aspect, I think there's several things that can should be uh, reasonably said. Uh, this is, uh, the first is that this is not an area where uh, the fund has uh, lots of leverage, if I may put it that way. Uh, it, uh, so it is, it, is, uh, it is conducting sensibly, and I'm trying to encourage both it and, uh, and the other parties uh, to do it sensibly, a, 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 mutual, uh, a mutual effort. Uh, that will um, that will uh, where the fund is uh, is uh, holding the pen uh, and maybe making some suggestions. Right, a good secretariat actually uh, is a good secretariat, uh, and uh, and the question is whether the countries with the, who are participating in this dialogue uh, will uh, will see it in their interest to to cooperate with each other uh, in their common interests, uh, since they in some sense are all threatened by uh, the United States and Europe and other countries doing silly things in this area. Uh, and, uh, but they don't have a lot of leverage and they have a lot less leverage, it's fair to say, than uh, uh, was around when most of the other standards and codes of the fund uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and the bank uh, record compliance with uh, uh, we're, we're set down uh, essentially in the late 1990s. Um, but I think if, if they are successful, uh, if, the, if the effort is successful, and I certainly hope it will be, uh, I do think it would, uh, it would reinforce the point, uh, which is often forgotten by, uh, by uh, even friends of the fund, that the fund is a, about a lot more than just lending money. It's about international economic governance and providing other uh, public goods, uh, uh, and uh, and it's 
it's working on this code and if it has it ends up with a role in trying to score compliance with the code would be one more one more uh, international public good that the uh, international monetary fund would be supplying and I think in that context would help uh, refurbish the funds uh, image uh, as I know there are other people here from Capitol Hill uh, let me as well as other informed observers, there is a problem here. Uh, 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 people who are unhappy with the quote funds role on the exchange rate side uh, of things in recent years, in particular in this town, say, "Well, why do you let the fund do this? They they uh, didn't produce anything on the exchange rate side, uh, and so we should take it somewhere else." Not clear where else you take it, but take it somewhere else. Do it ourselves. Do it unilaterally rather than multilaterally. It's not a dominant view, but it is uh, it is a view that uh, I've I've heard uh, uh, on Capitol Hill. The OCD exercise, which is um, is my understanding, is much broader uh, than, in some sense, much broader than the sovereign wealth fund because it is designed to think about government, all forms of government investment, cross border investment not just by sovereign wealth funds. Uh, and uh, the fact of the matter is that the OECD has a number of codes uh, uh, and principles uh, now in this uh, area. Uh, and uh, Angel, our friend Angel Garia, uh, who I've known since the Mexican debt crisis in 1982, uh, was recently found himself quoted in China as saying, well, we're not going to do anything. I predicted if the OECD does not do anything, he's going to have a problem with his uh, uh, his G8 uh, his G8 uh, countries uh, since they asked him to do something uh, on this. And uh, and indeed, I think he will have a problem with some of the other countries who were who are looking for some degree of uh, of a quid pro quo. Now, I think the problem here is that uh, you know most of the countries OECD countries have. Uh, regimes on investment which are basically open with two exceptions. They have a prudential carve-out and they have a national security carve-out. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the best the fund, the, the OECD can do is to reinforce the standards that have already been set down there and, uh, and codify them as they apply explicitly to government, uh, government uh, investments. Uh, and I would hope they would, would do that. The notion, I think, that you're going to roll back, you know, you're going to have a new OECD standards which says the United States should uh, rewrite the FINSA or the CFIUS legislation ain't going to happen. Uh, you might have an OECD standard that says don't go further <laughs> in this direction, and that might that would be a constructive uh, action, and I think. Uh, and I think uh, that I guess my guess is that's what's likely to come out of the whole process. But there are probably people in this room who know better than I. Uh, yeah. uh, Doug Redeker at New America Foundation. Um, on both this scorecard and on the earlier version, Abu Dhabi, Adia, and Badala both show up extremely uh, low. Um, and how do you reconcile that, given that they've got over 30 years of what can only be described as professional investing? Uh, and yet they do show up at the very bottom, and you made reference before to Russia with its newly created fund, which is doing everything it can to comply with transparency and best practices. I would hazard that most people in this room and in this country would be much more afraid of Russia's motivations rather than Abu Dhabi with a 30-year track record. So how do you reconcile Abu Dhabi's poor uh, grades on your scoreboard with its actually uh, rather highly regarded performance and also, what would you say would be the result if Abu Dhabi, in particular, being the largest sovereign wealth fund, were to say we fail to agree and don't want to comply with any voluntary or otherwise set of best practices, would you say that their potential to withdraw what is this, uh, supposed to be several hundred billion dollars of investment in our markets is a real risk that we should be prepared to address? Well, that's a bunch of questions, good questions. Um, I think uh, on the first one, there are a number of possibilities, right? Uh, I don't know what I'm talking about in my scoreboard. That's that's certainly possible. I'll entertain that. I don't necessarily agree with it, but but, but uh, I entertain that. Entertain that. Uh, I think uh, a more 
A second answer is that uh, a second answer is that, um, uh, and uh, Mohammed Al Aryan uh, was here and made this comment in October when I presented the first version, and he said everybody knows that these are a bunch of professionals, and I think every professional market person does know that these people are a bunch of professionals, right? Uh, then I like. Then I told my, in response, told my Arthur Burns joke. Uh, so I'm going to tell it again. That's not most of you probably haven't heard it. You know, in uh, 1975, when the Federal Reserve was thinking about the whether it should announce its target for the federal funds rate, which it always had. It had a target. It just didn't announce it. Uh, it didn't announce anything, but it did every time, right? Right? Uh, Arthur Burns uh, said uh, to various people and. You know, my neighbors in Vermont don't need to know what the federal, fund, federal FOMC's target for the federal funds rate is. The people who need to know, know. Uh, and my neighbors in Vermont uh, do not need to know. So they don't need to know. Well, the world has changed. I mean, if the Federal Reserve today were to go back to not publishing its target to the federal funds rate, there would be uproar in Vermont as well as in New York. Um, and the world has uh, has moved on, and I think the world has moved on for uh, Abu Dhabi and a number of these other countries uh, uh, in the sense that uh, having a good reputation among your in the investment community is not enough when you are managing these large amounts of uh, money and which are viewed as threatening in the countries in which you're uh, investing. Now, my uh, moving on in your question. Uh, my interpretation of the fact that Abu Dhabi, along with Singapore, teamed up with my former colleagues at the Treasury Department two weeks ago, uh, ten days ago, and um, and endorsed a set of principles uh, uh, means that they are going to change. And I'm 100% confident that uh, that if we rerun my scoreboard, no matter what happens to the IMF exercise. If we rerun my scoreboard a year from now, Abu Dhabi will get substantially higher scores. Uh, one example uh, is that uh, in the first round, uh, the GIC in Singapore was also down at the bottom. If you look now, the GIC is in the middle. Uh, not No difference essentially between the GIC and Temasek. Uh, and so many of these funds are already changing and, and the process we take credit for this, of course, but uh, but we'll give a little bit of credit to other people. Uh, the process has produced produced uh, a change. Whether it is enough to satisfy the people on the other side, I think is a, is an open uh, is obviously an open question. And, uh, and, the, and the further they can go, I think, in reassuring uh, reassuring markets and politicians and the man and woman in the street, uh, the better off we all will be. Uh, and uh, uh, I do think that one of the problems is it was brought out by this uh, lovely survey uh, that I cite in the footnote of the first page of the policy brief about uh, uh, about sovereign wealth funds that was run uh, six weeks or so ago, um, uh, and they I'm sure it was a reputable sample survey of a thousand people. Uh, and they asked a bunch of questions, uh, one of which was, have you heard in the last th several weeks or months anything, or heard or read anything about sovereign wealth funds? The answer was 8% had. Uh, I joked the next day that, you know, my job now is to get sovereign wealth funds into double digits. Uh, but the same survey, right, it asked some general questions about foreign government investments, and they, a vast majority, plurality or majority, depending on which question, said that they were bad for the U.S. economy and bad for our national security. So you're finding a transferal of views about foreign government investment in general, right, to sovereign wealth funds. Uh, and, uh, and I think there are issues about sovereign or foreign government investment in general when it involves controlling stakes, and we have mechanisms to deal with those issues. I don't think in general that they're bad, but I think we have mechanisms to control, deal with the, uh, the national security dimensions of all that. Uh, but there is this confusion when you come to Russia uh, or you come to Dubai under some circumstances uh, and uh, on this point because they 
they don't differentiate between one and the other. And it would be unfortunate if you, you know, if you found that you know, the result of all this debate was we say, well, we're going to outlaw investment by sovereign wealth funds in the United States. But one answer is they take their money elsewhere. The second is they disguise it through an investment vehicle in the, in the, Singapore, in the Caribbean. Uh, or the third is they dismember, they, they disband it and say we don't have a sovereign wealth on the fund and they, and they just continue to go the way they've been going, uh, right? And maybe put more of it into the kinds of investment that, uh, that have raised bigger concerns. So I think uh, uh, that's basically my answer to that set of questions. Though it's what? good chat. Lex. Thank you. Uh, Lex Riefel from the Brookings Institution. Ted, I have uh, two questions about the roles of the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, first, uh, each of them has a pension fund, large, uh, fairly large, larger than some of the uh, funds in your list, I think, um, and we call these supra-sovereign wealth funds. And, uh, and maybe they have some rules and best practices and so forth that uh, you might, uh, might think about. Uh, but my, my second uh, question is about uh, a report I saw that um, I believe the government of South Korea has given some of its uh, assets to the World Bank to manage. And um, I'm uh, wondering if you have a view on uh, management of these funds by an institution like the World Bank or maybe even in the IMF. I mean, maybe there is some value to the world in having sovereign wealth funds placed uh, some of their funds with the IMF to manage on their behalf? Well, um, <laughs> Doug, you can look at the IMF World Bank Pension Fund and see how they do relative to CalPERS. Uh, they probably do pretty well, but uh, I suspect. But it is interesting, and I do think that many of the same issues arise, whether it's a super sovereign, super sovereign wealth fund or a sovereign wealth fund in the pension area, because uh, fundamentally it's the public's money. Uh, and the public ought to hold people accountable or have mechanisms to hold them accountable. So and that, 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 that's true for the IMF and World Bank, too, even if they have too much money. Uh, uh, on the second question, that's, uh, well, the, that's, of course, what my good friend Larry Summers originally proposed in this area before he did a 180 on this topic. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, that the way to do handle all this is just to give it to the fund and the bank to uh, manage and, uh, uh, on behalf of these uh, countries, and then you would cleanse it by passing it through the hands of the treasurer of the fund or the treasurer of the, of the bank. Um, now, the truth of the matter is, uh, uh, as I'm sure you know, and many other people in this room know, the bank has been in this business for years. Uh, I mean, it is in, let me put it point, pointedly, uh, with the former general manager of the BIS sitting in front of me, it is in competition with the BIS in managing government funds uh, and, uh, and offering investment vehicles for, country, for countries that have uh, surplus funds that they want to put in the fund. And they, of course, the, 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 uh, they put them in the bank, and the bank takes its management fee. Uh, and, uh, and it's been doing this for, uh, I would say, approximately three decades. Um, uh, I would, uh, I'm, don't hold me to that, but uh, well, it's not something new. This is maybe a particular, a new one, right? A new, a new, a new, new and I think uh, fundamentally nothing wrong with it in some sense, though one could ask whether you actually want to take the fund or the bank and put them in this business. Um, uh, Larry Promise is in the audience, and I'm now going to bite my tongue, so I won't say the next couple sentences. Um, uh, and in some sense, it's, you know, more competition is better. I think the general view, which also was articulated by Larry, that if you have a manager, right, and with a, some sort of a mandate, uh, to manage the funds, that cleanses the funds, I think doesn't, doesn't, um, quite wash. Uh, I've spent too much time with lawyers over the last, um, over the last uh, three decades, four decades. Uh, you know, there are lots of ways of writing those contracts, and you can write a contract about how you manage the funds, which is just as unattractive from a, 
uh, we're concerned about political or economic influence as uh, or as much involves as just as much in terms of conflict of interest in terms of inside information uh, as uh, as uh, not. So so although you can write one which is truly arm's length. We give it to the bank, and you decide what you do, and send us a report card every quarter about what our returns are. We don't care what you buy, or, or how you buy it. Or you could have what we will put this here, and we want you to buy. You know, certainly stay away from these ten countries because these ten countries are on our blacklist. Uh, and uh, uh, so we could do a lot of a uh, lot of different ways. Fundamentally, I don't think the fund of the bank should be in this business, quite frankly. Yeah, but. Uh, but it's not uh, not the biggest issue. The principal reason uh, for an oil exporting country uh, or commodity exporting country to have a sovereign wealth fund is to is to convert wealth that was underground to wealth that's above ground, uh, and not to go on a big binge party. Both because then you don't have anything left over after the party is over, uh, and because you're likely to destroy your macro economy in the process, uh, driving up your exchange rate by, and uh, and all kinds of and things like that. Uh, and it is a so therefore the economic management logic of behind setting up a sovereign wealth fund to sort of manage the macroeconomics. That's why I emphasized all this stuff about the budgets stuff. Uh, uh, as well as uh, is is very is important uh, because one dimension is to achieve, help to achieve macroeconomic uh, uh, stability. Now, what you do in a circumstance in which a country, and secondly, you know the problem is you got all that money and the political process to spend the money that is there. The political pressures are huge, and I understand that. And indeed, uh, that, as I said, is one reason why. Some countries don't want to tell them how much is the money is in the kitty, uh, uh, and it's. Uh, but and so therefore, the institutional political structures are not there, as you say. What whether the answer for that is just spend it willy nilly? I don't think so. Well, presumably, you would want to uh, you would want to uh, work on it as much as possible, and and the fund and the bank uh, have been working with these countries to try to help them manage their these. Uh, this uh, this uh, windfall in a way that is uh, strongest for the country, but several countries, two in principle oil exporting countries, Ecuador and Nigeria, have had several sovereign wealth funds which have been destroyed by the political process. And if you read the history of uh, Alaska or Wyoming and its own state level sovereign wealth fund, uh, they too have had some difficulties about trying to. Uh, Lock this stuff up so in a way in which it's spent sensibly uh, and spread out through the generations. Uh, but the answer for you guys in the State Department and the fund and the bank is to not to give up. I think. Ernie. Oh, here. Honor the board of CSIS. Uh, I may have missed this, but what is the uh, total dollar estimate of the amount invested in the United States by those 54 funds? Um, I haven't put my finger up in the air to find out, uh, because that's what it would have taken. Uh, one of the interesting features of all this is that um, uh, no one has... No, it, Sovereign wealth funds or government investments are not separately identified in any country's balance payments accounts, international transaction account. We count their reserves. Uh, and if the sovereign wealth fund is held by a we is held by a central government entity, at least in principle, uh, it should show up as foreign government claim of the United States. But a lot of these things don't show up that way, uh, and certainly the non the non financial components don't show up that way. Uh, we don't collect the statistics, nor does anybody else. Right. So if you look at Norway statistics, it doesn't. In fact, the sovereign wealth fund does not show up, and uh, and similarly, uh, uh, Cowper's quarter of its assets are held abroad. Right. 
they don't show up as a, they don't show up as a government owned outward investment like uh, uh, a AID loan would be. So the answer is uh, there aren't any comprehensive statistics. First approximation, you know, we're 25 percent of world GDP. Uh, we're about uh, a third or slightly higher share of global financial assets, somewhere between 25 and, and 33, maybe a little higher. Uh, probably is in the United States in one form or another. Uh, and, uh, but that's, that's, that's the best I can do. Well, that would be a trillion or so. Yeah, yeah, probably, probably. In one form or another. Yeah, Arnie, Ernie, and then. Uh, <coughs> uh, Ernie Pree, Manufacturers Alliance. Uh, a couple of references to WTO before, some parallels such as the national treatment principle. Uh, another p possible parallel is the question of. Uh, government export subsidies. In the WTO, there's a subsidy agreement. And generally, they're prohibited, and they could face countervailing duties if they go forward. And, uh, well, I guess my question, is there a parallel where in sovereign investment where some investors might have strategic interests, China, Russia come to mind, to subsidize investments uh, so as to get some form of control, if not acquisition, for example, energy companies, raw material suppliers, or Silicon Valley companies with big R&D whether it's related to national security or not. So my question is uh, whether this is fair for competing uh, U.S. private investors uh, to face potential subsidized investment, uh, and if so, uh, what should we do about it? Well, um, national treatment was written into the International Banking Act uh, in 1978, right, when I was at the Federal Reserve, and we we open economy macro uh, free traders. We're very proud of that because uh, uh, it was the first time the United States actually put into law that, that principle. So we're all in favor of national treatment. Uh, at least I am. Uh, I think, as I commented at the end, I, I think you are on a, somewhat of a snipe hunt uh, when you in, in terms of sovereign wealth funds per se, when you talk about subsidized investment. Sovereign wealth funds, as far as I'm concerned, right, in the relevant framework is assets which are already outside the country. They, for whatever reason, you can argue and you can discuss and you can disapprove of how those assets were accumulated through foreign exchange market intervention and so forth and so on. And, uh, and there are lots of good reasons for complaining about how the government build up those assets to uh, worry about cartels and various things, all kinds of things that are right. But once they're there, right, I don't see how the fact that uh, you know, they have to be invested in something, right? Uh, well, I mean, we could force them to be held in, uh, in uh, demand deposits if you wanted to, I suppose, but I wouldn't think that's wise. Uh, then they certainly would go somewhere else. Uh, and I don't see how there is a particular subsidy involved in the action of the sovereign wealth fund. Now, the one exception, which I had in my in my uh, remarks, though there's no reason, and is in the paper, but no reason why you should have caught it. It would be if a sovereign wealth fund, in turn, teams up with a government-sponsored company, right, and says we're going to provide you the foreign exchange off-market transaction, maybe and do the accounting difference. Then I think you could make a case uh, uh, for that. But if if the sovereign wealth fund, uh, uh, you know, Temasek buys a chunk or a controlling chunk of some uh, widget manufacturer, right? I don't see how you think of Temasek as being, in some sense, having an unfair advantage just because it's sitting on a pile of foreign exchange. Again, accepting the point about whether it should have gotten the foreign exchange to begin with. But starting from that point, I don't see, and, and then the third point, obviously, is if it is a strategic investment, then we have our procedure, we have our procedures to worry about that. Uh, now we if people in this town uh, don't always agree on how those procedures are applied, that's a, because their judgments are involved. But I think, uh, but we do have procedures so that if, if in the best judgment of 11, uh, eight, I think it is 12, 11, whatever it is, agencies of the government that they think that that threatens our national security, then then the uh, the, uh, the investment won't go forward. Now we're talking about controlling investments, or there will be some degree of a mit mitigation agreement that applies to copper mines or widget manufacturers or whatever it might be. Ted, could I ask you to generalize on this last answer? You've studied sovereign wealth funds more than anybody, and you also had great experience in the government with the CFIUS process and all that. Have you in your 
examination of the topic, come across a single case, any case, of investment in the United States by a sovereign wealth fund that you would have rejected on national security or any other ground, so that the anxieties that are often expressed, do they have any basis on the historical record so far? Well, not in my judgment. I mean, you have to qualify the United States. I think there have been a few uh, sovereign wealth fund investments around the world which were certainly motivated by political considerations. Uh, if you want to be nasty about it, you can talk about, uh, I can never remember the name, the, the takeover of the assets of the former prime minister, president, what is Th Thailand, right? President? President? Prime Minister, Prime Minister of Thailand, right? Was that mo motivated by political considerations on the part of Sa Singapore? I don't know, right? Ask the Thais, ask the Singaporean. In the United States, uh, in the United States, I don't think you have them, though I think it's fair to by sovereign wealth funds, now narrowly defined, uh, uh, as opposed to other kinds of, uh, uh, I, I don't not know any, uh, because there are very few controlling, I mean, very few of them get involved in controlling investments. Uh, uh, and I suspect my understanding is very few of the controlling investments that do have controlling investments here in the United States. Again, it's not hard; to, it's not always easy to find that. But I, it's, I, I have not turned up any, any, uh, any uh, evidence. I do think, and just trying to uh, be a two-handed economist, I do think that there are some issues that come up in the context, and I've testified on this, so uh, I just didn't put in this brief. Uh, in the, in the case of financial institutions, uh, because uh, financial institutions are treated in the United States as quasar, they're highly regulated. Uh, certainly the deposit-taking financial institutions are highly regulated for good reason. They're treated largely as, uh, as uh, public utilities in many respects. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, they are under, you know, then they, they operate under the um, watchful eye, if you want to put it that way, of the United States government in one form or another, right? And the notion of having another government that might have a different interest, but either economic or even political, uh, in how a, how a financial institution was being run, even if they didn't hold a controlling state, but just were a major shareholder, I think raises some questions that my friends at the Federal Reserve, uh, 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 I sure, I'm sure are, uh, wrestling with. Uh, they recently testified on this subject, and I confess I haven't read all of Scott Alvarez's testimony. But there are issues there, and I think there are issues for the supervisory process where you, how you deal with it. Because you do have, as, as Larry Summers has said, I mean, in the end, you have a government investor on the other side. Uh, and the question is whether that government investor is going to bow to the government views that are articulated on this side, and that is in particular comes up in the case of regulated, government regulated uh, industries. Uh, but I don't think, I would not point to any, right? Now that, I mean, you can look, presumably look at, and I don't think there have been a lot of, uh, we don't gay uh, sills left, and this is probably information one could get. I don't think there have been a lot of sovereign wealth funds, maybe Robert knows, a lot of sovereign wealth fund investors that have gone through the CFIUS process. Uh, sovereign wealth fund per se, right? In the sense that they've involved control by a and the and the control is being exercised by the sovereign wealth fund. Uh, uh, so I think, but then I, we can ask Gay. Uh, but you are suggesting Ted, that the only subcategory of cases where you might have some concern would involve control of the. Well, I, I think it's sort of, you know, it is sort of control. It is sort of control because I mean, you know, the, uh, uh, the phrase I use is undue influence, right? So a major shareholder, even if they don't have control, can have considerable influence over the activities of, a, of an entity. And if that activity is a is a uh, is a uh, uh, you know a high, in a highly regulated that that entity is in a highly regulated industry, you can at a minimum have conflicts uh, and. Uh, the other problem, of course, with financial institutions, as opposed to brick and mortar investments, is financial institutions can be looted a lot easier than than uh, 
most other forms of direct investment. They could be closed down, which is a form of looting, I understand. But, but, uh, but uh, as uh, it is it's much easier to loot a bank, right, and drive it in, into the ground, right, than it is to loot a, uh, a widget manufacturer. Um, okay, Peter? Peter Bottelier, Johns Hopkins Size. In your comparison of the structure of these funds, have you looked at all at the way they are financed, at the way, the way they are funded? Let me explain. When Lo Jiwei, the head of the uh, Chinese fund, was here a few months ago, he told an audience that he has to pay somewhere between 4 and 5 percent interest to the finance minister every quarter, which would suggest that a large part, if not all of his fund, is debt financed. A debt financed fund operates under very different conditions than a, an equity financed fund. What do we know about it, and what, how does that feature in your analysis of the comparative performance of these funds? Well, the answer, I think, the answer is we don't know, or I don't know, uh, systematically about. I mean, the, the different funds are funded through various different kinds of arrangements, right? Uh, sometimes they involve going through the foreign exchange reserves and therefore having liability. Sometimes they have uh, they have an exchange of assets like, which, like with respect to CIC uh, and so forth and so on. Some of them may, the uh, foreign exchange may never get into the, never get into the, uh, never get, get into the hopper. Uh, uh, at a level of 30,000 feet, I think, um, I think it actually doesn't matter. Right? Uh, what's relevant is the consolidated balance sheet of China, the government of China, right? And the fact that Mr. Mr. Liu owes money to another piece of the government of China is like worrying about the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve separate from the balance sheet of the United States Treasury, right? They're all part of the same government. So the notion that somehow, and the same holds for pension funds, right? The notion that these things have liabilities, right? Now, obviously, you have to do the accounting right and so forth and so on. But I don't, but in some sense, all funds that are, because they're government owned assets, have liabilities. They have a liability to the citizens of the country, right? Uh, and it may be expressed as a, as a IOU of some sort or may not. So I don't think the notion that somehow that he has to pay four or five percent means that, uh, I mean, it's hard to imagine how he's going to do this since two thirds of his assets are claims on other Chinese institutions. Uh, and, uh, and uh, who knows what that interest rate is? So it's a uh, it's a little a little hard to for me to figure out what the China is actually doing with that one. But as, as a first approximation, I I know I'm going to get blowback from people in this room. Uh, I think that's a sort of largely not not not, not a, the accounting obviously does matter to some degree, but it is not it is not the it's not the the most important issue it seems to me in this uh, area. Final question, Andrew Crocker. Ted, institutional investors often have uh, an attempt to make a, if you like, a negative rather than a positive influence. They, they say we won't invest in certain sectors for ethical reasons. I can imagine that sovereign wealth funds might not want to involve, invest in particular countries. Obviously, Israel comes to mind for those reasons. Do you see that kind of uh, involvement of a sovereign wealth fund defining uh, exempt categories that they're not prepared to invest in uh, would provoke either economic or more likely political reactions uh, on the part of uh, thinking of the U.S. Congress but other uh, receiving countries? Well, I think i give you two answers. Uh, we include on the scoreboard that question. So as a first approximation, my view is that the, if the funds are going to have ethical guidelines, they ought to say they have ethical guidelines and say what they are, right? And then we can... And uh, or if they not, they should say they don't. We're, we pursue the best return wherever it is. They pursue the endowment approach, uh, uh, and I think that's and that. So it's, I think they should be clear about what they do and what they don't. And that was one of the, the fifth question under governance. Uh, then the second part of the question is if they if they have if those ethical guidelines have a lot of political content, if you want to put it that way, we will not invest in anything that has to do with Israel. I suppose that we will not invest in anything that has to do with nuclear weapons, which is what some of them do. Uh, then there is likely to be a uh, 
uh, I, 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 the world is round, so there's like a <laughs> political uh, backlash. Whether it is, uh, or at least some, I mean, it's a bit like how do you feel about um, Amherst College, which uh, declines to invest in companies that invest in Sudan, right? I suspect that there are children, uh, parents, uh, who don't send their children to Amherst College because because Amherst has adopted that uh, that rule, right? Uh, and so that's one form of political back backlash. But you know, again, I think the world is. I think you're better off putting the cards on the table than pretending something otherwise. Uh, though I could imagine, and I describe that as probably one of the more controversial components of what I have in here.